<laughs> Jingle balls. <laughs> Hello and welcome to the Tanker Dome Holiday Special. I'm your host, Jet Lee. Happy end of year. Uh, the, uh, happy winter holidays. Uh, let's hope New Year won't be as bad as this year. Yada, yada, yada. 2020 meme. 2021, 2025. Gonna be like... I thought this is 2019, but it's 2030. Hey... Funny, funny joke about cynicism. Funny joke about the world ending. Inside joke about the planet dying here. <coughs> Conor McGregor break leg. <laughs> Michael Chandler, the Joker. <laughs> Takara vs. Tension announcement. That will never happen because... It never happened before. <laughs> Derek Bronson, blonde hair, funny stance. <laughs> Derek Bronson, stand funny. <laughs> MMA bad. MMA bad. MMA bad. <laughs> all right. Now, now that I've f now that I've done all the jokes that you're supposed to make. If you're an MMA podcaster, we can get this shit out of the way. Uh, hello and welcome to Tinker Dome. I'm your host, Iggy. And uh, yeah, this is the holiday episode. It's I'm actually recording this on New Year's Eve. And uh, hopefully I'll be done with it in like maybe like 40 minutes or something. I don't want to waste too much time. Uh, apologies for... Not covering the Oliveira versus Paul year uh, pay per view, the, the the last pay per view of the year, which was honestly very awesome. The fight was very awesome, but other guys at the fight site have already covered it, so I figured. I mean, um, I was a tad busy, um, so apologies for that. Mum, uh, my mother has uh, had a bit of a health scare, but it's all sorted now. And she just needs a lot of rest, and uh, hence why I've. Taking upon all the holiday responsibilities to prepare dinner, to uh, go grocery shop shopping, all that kind of shit, and um, haven't spoken, haven't used English in a while, <laughs> in like two two weeks. I mean, there was this episode of uh, the Protected Neck podcast with uh, Dan Tom where I uh, that I phoned in horrendously because I didn't have any time to prep, didn't have any time to come up with any new topicals any new talking points and sound bites etc so but, but it, it was a pretty good episode then tom is always a worth a listen and then tom's stuff is always worth a listen and he always says interesting stuff so we'll certainly go and check that one out we didn't like uh, we talked briefly about how most stuff like uh end of the year awards that happens in mma just make no sense like for example like how do you judge a knockout of the year? Is it just a meme knockout that, that just happened suddenly uh, out of nowhere? Or is it a knockout that was that happened at the high level and uh, the other guy was setting it up for like the, the entire fight? Like 10 rounds passed and then it was like a pitch perfect punch. Is that a knockout of the year? Or is it a, like a, I don't know, a fucking 720 degree spinning flying knee or something? So that sort of discussion happened on that episode so that was interesting but then again we kind of talked about it on uh, the um, 2020 on end of the year MMA podcast at the fight sites MMA podcast so, eh. I mean the world is a flat circle joke <laughs> you know this this year I mean this year was actually very significant for me because this is the year when I actually started doing this full time. This is the year when I actually started putting out content regularly and um, my life has taken a turn for the better, quite a drastic turn compared to, I guess, most people in the world. So there's that. But then again, I deserve it. I deserve it because I l uh, live in a fucking field joke. <laughs> 
All right, I'm done. <laughs> I'll, <laughs> I'll stop doing that, I promise. But I mean, uh, this year was... Uh, well, this was certainly a year for combat sports. Uh, lots of stuff happened. But the problem is, I, I have been meaning to record this end of the year episode like for, for quite a while now. Because I figured I would just talk about uh, everything that was significant this year and like point out any significant developments and then then I realized that I that because I've been doing this like uh, week to week and uh, trying to like basically like doing basically shitting out content as I went along without really like uh, having an outline or planning this out uh, ahead of time because I mean you can't do this shit with the UC schedule and uh, the combat sports schedule basically what I'm trying to say is I remember everything, but simultaneously, at the same time, I remember nothing. Because, like, my brain is, like, consists of nothing but tidbits from combat sports, from <laughs> all combat sports across the board, from boxing to kickboxing to Muay Thai, MMA, obviously, and it's all just a giant mess. Uh, fights that happened in 2019 seem like... I seem to remember them happening in 2021, and fights that happened in 2021 I seem to remember happening in 2019, that kind of stuff. I'm sure uh, you, my listeners as fight fans, can relate to that, I suppose, to a certain degree. Uh, I've made a clear point of not watching every single event that happens. That's Kaposa's job. That's uh, Grabaka Hitman's job. So uh, I'm not as insane as him. And I actually have to uh, leave some space in my mind, in my brain, to actually do some fight analysis. So that's kind of impossible for me to do. The the things that he does, or the things that someone like Fanyo does, or Dan Albert, they watch every fight. And it's something I cannot do. I... I burn out incredibly quickly. Uh, I get bored easily, and I think one of the reasons is that the fight... Uh, uh, the combat sports discourse is kind of like one thing, the same topicals repeating themselves and playing themselves out over and over again. Uh, like uh, People fixate on the same talking points over and over again and it tires me out incredibly quickly. I get bored of it incredibly easily. Like, uh, uh, I think uh, prim the primary reason is that people let the UFC dictate too much of what they... Uh, what uh, like what fills their brain whenever they think about combat sports? I think about MMA. Like if more people didn't give a shit about the UFC and the personalities in it, this fan base would have been so much more pleasant. <laughs> like one of the primary reasons is that, as I've learned, is that like no offense to anyone, I'm not gonna name names, uh, and the people I've talked to are actually usually the exception. But on average, fighters are usually not just are just not very interesting. <laughs> they just like martial arts. And uh, th th that's it. They want to compete. They want to be they want to be good at this stuff. It's a, it's a it's a lifelong passion, etc. Uh, because and I mean that's a good thing because uh, the exceptions are usually extremely bad because sometimes you get people like Sean Strickland. <laughs> so you know, and beyond that, most people don't understand how fighting works. So whenever they talk about fighting, it's always like completely wrong. Whenever they talk about fighting, it's always just uh, the mo either the most sur surface level takes or just the most the wrongest shit ever, and everything just becomes exhausting. And the UFC is is a garbage organization. It's, a, it's a, Dana White is a cunt, etc., etc. I've, I've been talking. I've talked about this for the entire year essentially like and uh, yeah I guess uh, it's it's kind of depressing that nothing ever changes nothing's changing and uh, if anything things seem to be changing for the worst uh, and I've talked about this on the Protect Your Neck podcast and I've talked about how the UFC seemed to have seems to have hit upon a model where they can spend as little money for as for as much gain as possible, where they just uh, use the Apex, Apex Arena, uh, fill the fight night cards with uh, mid-tier talent and just basically garbage fights, and maybe one or two good fights 
to make you feel like the event was actually good. And uh, this, uh, and then they would like spend uh, a whole lot of money on on a couple good pay per views back to back to make you feel like this year is actually good, like good stuff is happening. And then it's back to basics. Then it's back to the usual like dredge, the usual sludge. But on the other hand, uh, there were some very significant de- developments. Developments still because. Uh, Obviously, ever since Khabib Nurmagomedov retired last year, the lightweight division has been a complete chaos. It's been it's been just non-stop violence back to back to back. So that was great. The title picture, I mean, Charles Oliveira has uh, cemented himself as the legitimate champion, I think. I think it's fair to say uh with, with his uh, recent victory and very impressive victory over Dustin Poirier. So there's that. Justin Gagey is still uh, looking for that title. Islam Makhachev is on, on, on the rise, but obviously I'm more excited about Gagey. But however, Conor McGregor still barges in. Uh, I mean, I'm fine with Charles Oliveira getting paid. McGregor has just has sort of become the cash cow. Uh, it's like the easy fight you take <laughs> at lightweight to get paid. Uh Kind of like astonishing how far from grace has uh, the Conor McGregor has fallen. Like it's the um, one of the most uh, meteoric plummets in recent history, in recent memory at least. I'm all here for that. I'm all here for the entirety of uh, the, the lightweight title. Uh, it's, it's like for the entirety of the uh, lightweight top five beating the shit out of Conor McGregor. I'm fine with that. <laughs> <laughs> featherweight is still featherweight uh, it's basically like just uh, Max Holloway and uh, Volkanovski who beat the shit out of everyone and and like th- there's everyone else bantamweight is always in, sh- in complete shambles I mean obviously everyone knows that Piotr Jan beats the shit out of everyone Aljamain Sterling has been getting steadily dumber <laughs> as time went on or maybe he hasn't got dumber. Maybe he just went mask off and just demonstrated how dumb he actually is. Or maybe Piotr Jan has actually given him irreparable brain damage with that knee. So, uh, uh, hence why Aljamain Sterling has turned completely full-on anti-vax. TJ Dillashaw returned. Uh, looked very, looked very impressive, despite once again getting injured. Uh, I guess uh, it's kind of inevitable at this at, at this point in his career. He's uh, getting on. Uh, he's uh, he's. Uh, I wouldn't say he's slowing down, but he's clearly like uh, getting older. So uh, kind of alarming at this stage in his career. But I trust him to uh, patch things up, patch himself up. Still turn in a couple of good performances. Jose Aldo, Jose Aldo, the talk of the year. Um, just. Um, I don't do fight of the year shit, but um, I do, don't do categories like that. I don't do knockout of the year, submission of the year, anything like that. But um, if um, if he isn't, um, I'm, I I don't know if I would call him my fighter of the year, but he's certainly the veteran of the year, and uh, that's. Um, I mean, obviously, that's not saying much in MMA because there's like no one else who is a veteran and still competes at the highest level. He's the only one. Jose Aldo is the only one. Hardest division in the sport. Still dominates. It's just insane. <laughs> just ridiculous. But we've talked about this before. Just felt like this needed uh, emphasizing again. I mean, uh, between him, Max Holloway, Max Holloway, Volkanovski. And uh, it's it's kind of like basically what I'm trying to say is it's kind of a split between Jose Aldo, Peter Jan, Volkanovski, and Max Holloway. Um, it's a, it's a, it's a tie for the shit kicking of the year award. <laughs> shit kicking being like for uh, the one who gets awarded the, uh, the uh, gets given the award has dished out. The shit kicking of the year, not 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 taking it, <laughs> but uh, with Max Holloway, it's kind of skirting the line a bit, with uh, the latest Yair performance where he still 
took a lot of damage, but that's uh, Max Holloway for you. He always takes a lot of damage. It was very funny when he uh, kicked the shit out of Keita. It was actually the first um, podcast of the year for me. Uh, I've taken a lengthy hiatus before making that podcast because of personal reasons. Uh, went through a whole lot of nas- nasty shit in real life during that time, but um, that one, that performance inspired me to come back. And then it's kind of sort of like acted as a springboard for my, I guess, my career as a fight analyst. So there's that. And it was very funny when people started talking about how Max Holloway has redefined the meta. <laughs> it was a new Max Holloway, Max Holloway 3.0. But uh, when it was just Max Holloway doing Max Holloway stuff, but harder. <laughs> uh, what was that about? You know what? I'm just going to go chronologically through the events that happened. Kiesa vs. Magni, I didn't give a shit about that one, didn't watch that one. Poya vs. McGregor 2, uh, one of the best, straight up, hands down, one of the best outcomes uh, to a fight in a year. Very, very, like, I was basically like on 7th heaven when I saw McGregor go down and out. Uh, I spent three days drink three days in a row. I spent drinking with a buddy, so <laughs> just went nuts after that one. The event itself wasn't that great. Uh, Chandler, I guess, knocked out Dan Hooker, and the rest is just meh. Um, what else happened? Uh, fucking fuck! Come on! Oh yeah, Overeem versus Volkov. <laughs> oh Jesus! Uh, oh yeah, Corey Sanhagen jumped in the jumped in the air and knocked out Frankie Edgar with a flying knee. That was a cool knockout. And da, 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 Usman versus Burns. That was a silly fight, fun silly fight. Um, uh, I guess Usman proved something, and that in that he like um, he went through some adversity in there, getting dropped with a powerful shot. A bit of an ugly contest, but still very, very entertaining. The event itself, eh. I'm noticing a pattern here. Uh, I haven't thought about these events in a while, but uh, I'm noticing a pattern here. And I think I pointed this pattern out in the beginning of the podcast. <laughs> Derek Lewis versus Curtis Blades. Oh, that was a bad knockout. Uh, scary, scary knockout. Yeah. Uh, Herb Dean was refing from refing from outside the, the cage for that one, as he ten, uh, as he does as he tends to do. Rosenstruck versus Gunn didn't watch that one, didn't give a shit about that one, and with good reason, I presume. Pedro Munoz versus uh, Jimmy Rivera was uh, happened during that card, and it was very silly. It was uh, when I started. I think that was the fight when my hatred towards calf kicks was cemented. Jan Blakovich versus Adesanya, hysterical. Absolutely hysterical event. <laughs> Peter Jan dominates Aljamain Sterling, beats him from pillar to post, suns him, ragdolls him, and then knocks him out with an illegal knee. <laughs> it's just... <laughs> I mean, people got really mad uh, in the aftermath, and the people are still like, oh, it's disappointment of the year. I think it's not a disappointment. I think it's the funniest thing that happened all year. It's fucking hysterical. Uh, this and then immediately like followed by <laughs> Megan Anderson turning in one of the worst title fight performances in history in MMA history and then Adesanya getting uh, like laid on by Jan Blachowicz after getting boxed up by Jan Blachowicz on the feet just amazing what's an amazing event uh, then then uh, Edwards vs Mohammed fucking Leon Edwards uh, clawing out below Muhammad's eye, just uh, man or cape, uh, just absolutely shitting the bed. Uh, hysterical. Bronson versus Holland. Uh, also incredibly funny because everyone was talking about how Holland is like the meme fighter and etc. And then, then it turns out just that uh, Kevin Holland is uh, not exactly like. Everyone started acting like Kevin Holland is a good fighter all of a sudden, when he's not, when he's a meme fighter. He was fine when people were uh, considering him a meme fighter, and I was fine with that. 
But I, what I'm not fine with is Kevin Holland being slotted in main events because he's not good. He doesn't belong there. Derek Brunson has proven that. So I guess go Derek Brunson. Miocic versus Ngannou too. Sad, sad outcome for Miocic. Incredibly, like, uh, incredibly impressive turnaround for Francis Ngannou. Um, Tyrone Woodley got, like, bombed on by Vicente Luque. Uh, I, I guess that's that. I think uh, Hax is writing something about Stipe Miocic, so stay tuned for that. But that's, that's going to come out next year already. Vittori versus Holland didn't watch that one, didn't care. Uh, I mean, I guess it's just Holland being Holland again. Or I did watch that one, I just, just purged it from my memory. Nothing happened on the rest of the card. Whitaker versus Gastelum. Whitaker shit kick Gastelum, obviously. Uh, don't remember anything else from the event, I don't think I watched it. <laughs> just don't think there was anything memorable. Usman versus Masvidal too. Amazing, amazing knockout. And uh, once again, cements the, um, cemented the general trend of Usman looking like he's chasing bees whenever he gets hit and like throwing these wild badonkadongs. Uh, like hands going all over the place. But whenever he picked his spots... Actually, find if, well, no, he picks his spots, he usually finds good connections. And in this one, he just threw the most perfect right hand I've seen in quite a while in recent years. Uh, Rose Namayunas defeated Communism, I guess. <laughs> uh, Shevchenko knocked out Andrade. Uh, Andraj. Oh, yeah, Chris Weidman broke his own leg in half. So that was that happened. Reyes versus Prochaska. Uh, Reyes, Dominic Reyes stock at, at an all-time low. Just ridiculous, ridiculous decision to change camps. Presumably because he thought he actually lost the John Jones fight. Absolutely ridiculous. Don't know what he was thinking. Ridiculous versus Waters and fucking hell. Fucking hell. Didn't watch that one. Uh, Oliveira versus Chandler. That was a good one. Obviously... Uh, incredibly entertaining back and forth fight between Chandler and uh, Oliveira. Everyone remembers that. Ever also, everyone remembers uh, the depressing outcome of Benio Darius blanketing to Tony Ferguson and then bizarrely calling out uh, like communism again. <laughs> Just uh, uh, Rob Font shit kick Cody Garbrandt. That was fun. Rosenstock vs. Sakai. Uh, I think that was during that time when I was trying to do that uh, uh, news recap thing. The news recap show that uh, Fenio edited. <laughs> uh, the problem was, Fenio was, uh, works full-time. He has a full-time job besides uh, the TFS job. And so it took him quite a while to edit the whole thing. And add the... Um, the cards, the music, and all that, you know, fuckery, the uh, bells and whistles and whatnot. So it always came out late and it took a whole lot of effort because I would write an entire script so it, the show would not turn into just a podcast. So that took about a day. So, uh, and first of all, I would take a couple of days to gather news, uh... Okay, and then another day to write the script. And uh, if um, if I felt good during that day, I, I would uh, do, I would record the actual recap that same that same day. And then it would take a couple of days to edit the whole thing. And then it would come out by the end of the week uh, when all the news are all already outdated. So we canned that project. Sadly, it was very fun. Uh, uh, kind of like. It allowed me to play around with the format a little bit. I've played with a new, um, unfamiliar format to me, and uh, kind of like, I think my wit has sharpened up a little bit, and <laughs> just uh, got to showcase like uh, some some of my uh, I don't know, comedic chops, I guess. So that was fun. Uh, what what was funny is that I would write these incredibly detailed scripts where I would uh, point out all the bits where I would want Fenya to insert a visual gag. 
but then he would would not read the script and then insert the same visual gag that I wanted initially anyway, <laughs> because we just share the same brain apparently. And the Sanya Vittori too. Uh, at the Sanya's talk, once again all time low. Davis and Figueroa shat shat the bed horrendously. Shat the bed horrendously. I'm sorry. Leon Edwards basically got TKO'd by Nate Diaz. I don't care. Fucking Nate. Fucking Leon Edwards. More like Leon Edwards. More like bitch. Leon Edwards. More like L. Eon Edwards. Leon Edwards, aka the person that fights like the opposite of his life story. I don't know. I mean, generally, generally speaking, I would feel for Edwards, uh, but I don't know. I just, I just can't find my, can't find it in myself. I uh, can't find the strength to, to, to the strength of will, the the willpower to force myself to care about Leon Edwards as a fighter and the person. Just, he's just a flat line to me, and this is a fight that cemented to me really in my mind the concept. That's all that I maintained very adamantly uh, throughout my commentary on Leon Edwards uh, from the moment that I learned about him is that uh, risk mitigating games uh, are actually self defeating in, in a way because uh, the way to mitigate risk in a fight is to finish the fight. You just have to finish the fight, just knock the, the other guy out. Just fucking knock him out, loser. <laughs> then no risk would be posed to you. <laughs> That's how you mitigate risk in fights. Korean Zombie vs. Iggy didn't watch that one. Gun vs. Volkov didn't watch that one. Uh, Paul U vs. McGregor 3. Um, hilarious, hilarious event. Uh, Gilbert Burns. <laughs> oh yeah, Tai to Ivasa finally fucking knocked out Greg Hardy, that piece of shit. Uh... Sean O'Malley shat the, shat the bad against Chris Moutinho. This is the fight that made me realize that uh, basically as long as you have a decent chin and can low kick, you can conceivably beat Sean O'Malley. Don't need a lot. And uh, uh, after this fight, I think Sean O'Malley was hospitalized with like a few, bro like several broken bones in his hands and uh, like a torn muscle or something like something ridiculous. <laughs> I think the, it's like this is just my I'm just going over my greatest hits right now Sean O'Malley the uh, sugar in Sean O'Malley the sugar in sugar Sean O'Malley isn't a reference to Sugar Ray Robinson or Sugar Ray Leonard or even Sugar Rashad Evans it's a reference to the fact that his skeleton is made out of candy there we go uh, Gilbert Burns wrestled Stephen Thompson. Finally, finally, someone wrestled Stephen Thompson. That was fun. Dustin Poirier boxed up Conor McGregor, and then Conor McGregor, Conor McGregor broke his own leg in half. Just hilarious. Makhachev versus Moises, ridiculous event. Uh, one that uh, made Makhachev stands pretend that Makhachev is actually like deserves a spot in the rankings after defeating Tiago Moises, who looked completely clueless against uh, Joe Alvarez immediately after. Sanhagen versus Dillashaw. Sanhagen versus Dillashaw was dope uh, for several reasons. Because one reason is that it showed that TJ Dillashaw still has it, and uh, that um, uh, and Corey Sanhagen got to show show off his uh, most of his skills. Like uh, it was Corey mostly doing his co like the usual Corey stuff. That was cool. Hall versus Strickland. Uh, nah, I didn't watch that one. Lewis versus Gunn, fucking hell. Oh yeah, we recorded alternate commentary for that card. Song Yedong versus Casey Kenny was fun. Uh, Vicente Luque versus Chiesa, Michael Chiesa dust himself. Uh, Jose Aldo versus Pedro Munoz. Uh, I've recorded a separate alternate commentary track for that fight. Because it just it was so entertaining. And the original commentary was so bad. And I felt like this fight warranted uh, a more in-depth analytical view because we recorded a live version where we reacted to things that as they were happening in real time and it was a lot of us a lot of it was us going oh holy shit Josie Aldo fucking legend hey and we still managed to get a lot of analysis in a lot of analytical commentary but 
I've recorded a separate analytical commentary that was just strictly technical stuff. So I guess go and check that one out. Uh, Zero Gun vs. Derek Lewis. I went on a piss break during the alternate commentary for that fight. It was just so fucking boring. Oh, Jesus. Uh, oh, yeah, it's it's when I went on heavy hands. It was the event after which uh, I went on heavy hands and just... And uh, the most polarizing episode of heavy hands in uh, heavy hands history. Like, everyone on Reddit hated my appearance. Everyone on Reddit just absolutely despised my... Uh, my presence on heavy hands and like the reason why I decided to do heavy hands like this like my heavy hands appearance the way I did it was because I find I find that Conor Rebush interrupts interrupts all his guests all the time and every time someone from the fight side went on heavy hands it was always them like going like being very polite and being very like um very gracious and uh, going like, oh, thank you for having me on heavy hands. Uh, thank you, Connor. Thank you, Connor. Like, uh, and uh, not giving a shit about being interrupted. Or Connor Rebush saying something I, I, I personally disagree with. Or my colleagues at the fight I disagree with and w go on record to say that they disagreed on the podcast, but decided not to speak out as to not uh, damage the flow of the show. And so basically my goal was to address all that. <laughs> so basically I went in there and just derailed the entire thing. So if you want to listen to someone just making Conor Rubush feel like he's about to explode, uh, go back and revisit that one. Uh, Kananir vs. Gastelum didn't watch that one. I mean, I didn't watch a, a whole lot of events because I generally like, try to avoid... Uh, watching too many events in a row because once again I, it just burns me out Giga Chikadze defeated Etzen Barboza you know what's funny what's funny is that I'm yet to watch a single Giga Chikadze fight a single one I haven't watched any of them uh, mostly because I just kind of can't bring myself to care about Giga Chikadze <laughs> I guess this makes me a bad analyst but then again if uh, time if the time comes to watch a Gigi Chikadze fight in an important bout for like a ranking or something, for like a high ranking, for a contender spot, then I would certainly study tape. And just I, I don't I generally speaking I don't need a lot of tape to study, like to study a fighter. Uh I would usually watch like a couple uh, informative performances and informative losses, and then I would pretty much know everything I would need to know. Uh, it's the opposite approach of um, it's it's an approach that's opposite to what Dan Albert usually takes uh, usually does because he watches everything and Fenio usually watches everything as well and it's become a bit of a meme that uh, I guess Iggy doesn't watch MMA he just pretends to watch MMA and just kind of makes shit up as he goes along <laughs> and it suddenly magically turns out to be right um, Smith versus Ben fuck Volkanovski versus Ortega, a round of the year. Um, I mean, it was a beating. It's a, it was a straight up beating. Alexander Volkanovski beat the shit out of Brian Ortega. There was just there were just a couple of spots where Ortega had uh, moments of success, but largely, Ortega's face was once again flattened, just demolished him. Santos versus Walker. Of poor Tiago Santos. Mm, also didn't watch that one. <laughs> you know, there weren't as many events as you might think. I think there was. That's because there was one spot. There was one spot where it was just like fucking nothing was happening, and I think that's when we started actually hammeraging pat patrons because we didn't record alternate commentary, didn't record resume reviews, and uh, there was a, a bit where Ed has went on a an extended hiatus. I don't know if he'll when he feels like coming back and recording and something on MMA or wrestling, then he will come back. But uh, the, the thing is, he was doing he was working full time. He was uh, studying uh for a job uh, for another job and he was uh, maintaining the website it was like he basically had three full-time jobs at the same time and he would still put out a piece of content every single day 
which was insane. Uh, and I guess that's that's very appropriate because uh, he studied wrestling uh, in America and he's an American citizen. And uh, that's the American school of wrestling, just grind and grind and grind and grind. <laughs> <laughs> so I guess I'm very thankful to it because it allowed me to focus on putting out content that doesn't strictly have an expiration date because uh, I mean uh, yeah th this thing of uh, reviewing every single event has gotten has got very old <laughs> just uh, just wanted an excuse to rip I just needed something to just get my brain jogging to just remember shit that I've done over the year with like the significance of the year, any significant things that I've done so basically um, what I set out to do this year was to cover topics that are seldom explored in, uh, com in the combat sports discourse and I think to a certain extent I succeeded uh, I'm not entirely satisfied with my output not entirely satisfied with my body of work so far there's still an enormous backlog of stuff I still want to cover like for example let's see let's see let's uh, go into my Google Docs see the schedule that I've the schedule scheduling document that I've written uh, a while ago there's also a whole bunch of shit canned projects, a whole bunch of um, articles that I haven't written, that I haven't finished writing, or articles that I just I think I'm never gonna finish. So basically, um, yeah, uh, teach. There was a teaching M MMA topical that I wanted to cover with. Uh, I, I think I wanted to bring Zach Makovsky on, so I guess I'm gonna do that next year. Maybe it's about turning fight analysis into useful coaching info, into useful scouting info. Prior to that, we've done communicating analysis, conveying analysis uh, with Hacks Operator and Dan. It's about communicating big brain concepts in a simple way. I guess we've... Um, I think we've done a good job. Um, there was also... Uh, a topic about assessing impact and damage in MMA. That was uh, that's interesting. I think that was in the aftermath of multiple wonky decisions and uh, multiple wonky stoppages in a row. I just uh, started thinking about the way most people assess damage. Like, if you have experience fighting or competing, or if you were like, if you either sparred hard or if you fought in an informal setting, basically on the street, uh, you would pretty much have a certain idea of what each strike does to you or, or your opponent if you don't get hit much, if you're lucky or if you're skilled. So, which is in contrast to people, to most judges who have no such experience, to referees who have no such experience, and to most viewers who definitely, most of them definitely don't have that experience. So, it leads to certain misconceptions, and uh, I witnessed that a lot in a fight discussion. People just kind of like uh, put too much. Uh, people just put too much stock in certain things, in uh, things like blood, bruising, um, the snapping motion of the head, etc., etc., etc. That kind of bullshit. And as um, I wanted to talk about that. And the rest is just... Oh yeah, with like a large project in this year was uh, a case study on Tyrone Woodley because I've got into a huge argument with uh, uh, Ed's wrestling friends, uh, the wrestling community called uh, uh, the Bajrang Boys. Uh, because uh, they insisted on that, on the fact that since Tyron Woodley is a UFC champion, that obviously must mean that he's very, very good. And uh, the goal was to evaluate his achievements, evaluate the context in which those achievements were, well, achieved, and uh, kind of evaluate skill. And kind of, it was mostly like, a, I was kind of trying to lay the groundwork for how I'm going to present my skill evaluations in the future. A lot of, I mean, I guess, I guess my work this year wasn't like all, all, all that uh, disappointing. 
uh, for, by any metric, but by, by my personal metric, is just kind of like, eh, could have done more, could have certainly done more, or can always do more. Um, I think I started out by writing very, very extensive, yeah, uh, lengthy mm, plans for each podcast. I would like write an outline, uh, write bullet points that I want to hit upon, and then evaluate upon those bullet points, and like write entire pre-prepared statements so I can uh, like uh, fire them off on the fly because I wasn't sure in my spoken English back then. Uh, and I certainly needed that. Now I just need a couple bullet points and then I'm pretty much good to go. But prior to that, uh, spoken English was uh, uh, like a big struggle. Like No joke, honestly. It's still a struggle. I still like, there are still certain things that annoy me in my own sp personal spoken English, like the accent for one, uh, the way I pronounce certain things, etc. Like the various mistakes, various spelling mistakes, or I guess pronunciation mistakes that I make. Uh, also, just uh, certain quirks, certain turns of speech that I use, certain like, um, I guess stereotypical turns of phrase to me, like the catchphrases, <laughs> sound bites, whatever, the buzzwords that I use, they, they kind of annoy me. I want to get, get rid of those, improve upon them to make for smoother listening. Learning editing was a big, was a big one. Uh, I think I've learned a lot about editing, like in the last three or four months, I think, or maybe five months. Uh, prior to that, editing podcasts has been a, a huge hassle, and I would, and I was also like incredibly insecure about my spoken English, and my spoken English was also worse, and so editing would take a lot of time. I would sometimes I would splice together entire sentences out of like completely unconnected statements. <laughs> like <laughs> that's how bad it was. I think I've done a good job on that. But by, by the way, if you go back and listen to some of the older episodes, they sound f mm. they make me cringe, but they sound fine, I guess, because people continued listening to me and they continued like. Uh, continued coming back for more so that was that uh, what else happened this year I mean everything that I've done at the fight side happened this year essentially like the bulk of the entirety of now of my personal work uh, we've built up our community quite a bit our community in discord which I'm which is something I'm very proud of I've tried uh, being very active in the Discord as 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 active as possible. There was also a very like very heartwarming moment when the, my advice has actually helped out a fighter in an actual fight, and uh, he dominated his fight. Uh, I don't know if he's he would be comfortable with me disclosing his information, but I guess. I mean, he's a fighter. <laughs> he, he, he wants more attention. He wants he wants eyes on him. His name is um, Matt Fordham. He's an amateur MMA fighter. He's uh, 3-0 and and he's had um, a very dominant performance over his last opponent. And uh, he, he thanked me personally in the Discord for giving him... for, for give, giving certain tidbits of advice. Uh, and he said that he never felt lost... Uh, throughout the entirety of that fight and just it was like the most that, that's that's the most important the most important type of feedback that I could have received all year and uh, it, it was it was in that moment when I think that I've stopped feeling uh, if not the entirety but at least a certain like significant part of Impo imposter sy syndrome that I've been feeling throughout this entire year it's kind of like alleviated a lot of that con a lot of those concerns that I felt throughout the year <laughs> so that, that was certainly a heartwarming heartwarming not heartwarming <laughs> fuck ah Jesus it was 
It was a very significant moment, okay? It felt very good to hear that. <laughs> so, thank you, Matt. Moving on. Uh, by the way, if there's a footage online, if you can find footage online and check it out, it was a very cool fight. Here's to uh, further success, uh, further skill growth and domination uh, in mixed martial arts to you. Like, like Happy New Year, <laughs> Matt. Thank you. I mean, oh yeah, the um, talk to Nate Quarry, uh, talk to Zach, Zach Makovsky. I think it's like the first a couple times when I've spoken to Zach Makovsky was uh, in a group setting. It was a group panel about toughness in, in MMA. We evaluated the definition of toughness in MMA and the harmful stereotypes associated with it. And I still was incredibly nervous. And I'm always incredibly nervous. I, I used to be, at the very least, incredibly nervous when I was like speaking to, uh, like, well, first of all, native language speakers, and uh, uh, well, figures of some of of certain repute in in the sphere of MMA, uh, especially like a former champion like Zach Mankowski, or like like e even speaking to uh, Danny Martin and Sriram on the MMA podcast a year ago was like nerve-wracking to me. <laughs> I think you can hear my voice trembling back then uh, if you go back and listen to that episode. Uh, it was an episode about the worst game plans in MMA. And uh, and then it was shortly followed by uh, a panel on, uh, on amateur MMA uh, where... And it featured Zach Makovsky and the Jose Schulte Torres, where they talked about uh, the um, the various organizations that govern amateur MMA, the future of the sport. And I'm not entirely satisfied with that episode. I think it's the the episode that I'm most embarrassed about because uh, I've kind of very quickly lost control of the group and um, like didn't manage to keep group on topic um, and uh, we didn't really like necessarily cover the bullet points that I wanted to cover exactly so that was a personal disappointment to me but uh, there was still a lot of interesting information stated on that episode I think so I guess uh, I, I mean with the amount of garbage that gets put out gen in general about MMA I guess it stands out as being fine it's perfectly fine Uh, then there was obviously the Heavy Hands episode, and uh, there was also a conversation with uh, Nate Quarry. And that one was completely nerve-wracking. I, I I don't know how I feel like. I damn near shat myself <laughs> prior to the recording. I didn't sleep. I didn't sleep. At, like I, I've slept maybe for a couple hours before I recorded the, 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 the conversation. Mm. Uh, I wrote a bit of an outline prior to that conversation, but I've decided to mostly keep it free flowing because I, I figured Nate Quarry would have a lot to say, and he certainly did. So I was kind of bailed out on that episode because Nate Quarry just kind of like kept the conversation going because he he just has so much to offer on the on the subject of MMA in its current state as a sport as a as a financial venture, I suppose. I mean, one thing that I would like to happen is to for Nate Corey to come back and offer input on some other subject regarding MMA, like uh, the social issues, I suppose, that uh, permeate the world of MMA, that lead to the all the problems that we have right now uh, as a fan base. There's still, like... I mean, once again, there's an enormous backlog of topics that I still wish to cover. So I guess I'm, um, and uh, dumb shit continues happening in this sport week to week. This this is MMA, one of the dumbest sports <laughs> in human history. So I'm never gonna run out of out of topics to cover, I suppose. And uh, I will always have work to do. So I guess there's my job security right there. I mean. <laughs> I guess I'm proud uh, in a certain way of the work that I've done, but I'm not satisfied with it. 
Does that make sense? Uh, I don't think that I've done quite enough this year. And I would would like to do better. I would like to improve. The one thing, the one thing that I'm really proud of, however, is the uh, Discord community that we've managed to maintain and grow throughout this year, because um, we've received like um, the new arrivals uh, that visited our Discord this year and stayed in it, decided to stay in it were I mean they're simply amazing these people it's, it's just great we've just academics uh, like various professionals like extremely qualified professionals of various like di- in various diff- different fields one person one person in our discord is a leading industry professional is a le- is a leading specialist um in their field and that's just incredible it's uh, <laughs> it, i was kind of blown away by the fact that this is the type of people we were able to draw in through our work and they found us interesting enough to listen to and interesting enough to like interact with us uh despite being like like <laughs> it's just uh, having an iq that is several hundred degrees higher than, than mine or any of our, any of the people on stuff except I guess hacks. So the Discord has become a place where people just come to unwind and just share knowledge. It's just it's the thing that everyone talks about the internet becoming, and the internet has become the opposite of that because the sheer overload of information leads to people kind of being feeling burnt out and not interacting with info and not seeking out deeper info not seeking out quality data you know what i'm like i guess you understand what i'm talking about like the like junk data and garbage information is what sells it's what spreads even within the context of mma if you look at the content that spreads that gets clicks that gets views uh is uh Complete bullshit. It's like uh, various sound bites that fighters say, and for, like it's like Jack Slack said. Jack Slack once said that uh, the new Oscar Wilde is uh, hardly going to come from MMA, <laughs> and that's largely true. Uh, but ex- but still, stuff like uh, the fucking super necessary stuff and the, the three piece and the soda is what gets traction online. While quality analysis like just flounders somewhere in the in in the ether, it's stuck in a limbo. Uh, most of our stuff gets like the, the the highest amount of views our stuff has ever got. I think was the interviews that um, Ben Cohn has done with uh, John Anik and uh, Michael Chiesa. So uh, certainly, thank you, Ben Cohn. Stay tuned for the upcoming uh, panel. On bad commentating in MMA that features Ben Cohn. It's uh, me, Dan Albert, Haxerized, and Ben Cohn talking about bad commentary in MMA. And as we all know, commentary... I mean, uh, it wasn't worse than in the previous year. It was about as bad as in the previous year, as I would put it. It's just um, uh, Joe Rogan being terrible on, on the mic, coming up with bullshit narratives. DC buying into those bullshit narratives. DC podcasting in the commentary booth instead of actually like talking about what's happening in the cage uh, the usual stuff and i mean th- i guess that's uh, that's as good a, a point as any to uh wrap this one up and wrap this entire year up and uh just come to a conclusion on what the year was and how it what it seemed to bring uh, the new developments, etc., et et all that kind of stuff. The way I would put it is, uh, it wasn't necessarily a groundbreaking year in any respect. I think it was largely a continuation of the trends that we saw in 2019 and 2020 coming to a head. Uh, the roster in certain um, the lightweight elites are largely aging out 
sad but true. But I think it's uh, what's significant, and I'm very glad that it seems to be happening, is that all, all of the lightweight elites will fight each other before they all retire and go on with their lives. Bantamweight uh, seems to be somewhat veering towards unfucking itself, finally, with the coming of uh, Piotr Jan, with the rise of Piotr Jan, who fucking beats everyone. <laughs> it's just <laughs> an insane killing machine. That's what we needed at Bantamweight. Uh, uh, in a division of crazy killing machines, we needed a complete... Uh, un- like uh, an unfeeling cyborg, an unfeeling ruthless cyborg to just cut through everyone and uh, get rid of all the bullshit that surrounds the Bantamweight title picture. Welterweight, uh, Welterweight has always been a bit dog shit, honestly. It was uh, at its best during the uh, GSP era, but it wasn't like mind-blowingly good. Even during the uh, g- during GSP GSP's reign, and it's come to a head. Um, like right now during Usman's reign, like the the sheer fact that Tyron Woodley managed to stay at the top of that division and be the champion of that division for so long is an indictment on both the division and on the matchmaking of that division. Like the matchmaking uh, of the UFC's matchmaking is was is is like it's baffling at the best of times, but in the welterweight division specifically, it it's at its it's. At its worst, is how I would put it. Because, like, for the longest time, it's been, con- like, promising contenders, promising up-and-comers, I would say, rather, prospects, beating the shit out of each other, fighting laterally instead of moving up. It's a general trend in overall in the UFC, but it's very pronounced in the welterweight division. And it's led to the situation where there's now no one for Kamaru Usman to fight, really. He mops the floor with, with everybody. Like, Leon Edwards was the uh, sacred cow of that division for, for most, I guess, hipster fans, but uh, I don't think that's going to manifest in any way, shape, or form. I mean, Le- Kamar Usman is uh, certainly at a point where he is uh, his decision-making is questionable enough for Leon to find a way to kind of, like, uh, eke out... A wonky decision, but that's it. It can like it can go two ways. It it's either a Kamaru Kamaru Usman knockout, it's either an ugly Kamaru Usman knockout, or an incredibly just mind-numbingly shockingly boring fight. Uh, in either direction. Uh, middleweight is a wasteland. It's always been a wasteland. It's uh, it's not been a wasteland during uh, the the short brief period when Robert Whittaker, Yo uh, Romero, and Paul Acosta were all like fighting at the same time, and Israel Adesanya was up and coming through the ranks. Uh, that was exciting. Paul Acosta has uh, went on to shit the bed. Uh, Robert Whittaker got starched, Yo Romero got cut, and now it's just... It's basically like a prelude. Like, the way it works, uh, lightweight is a preview of welterweight. Welterweight is a preview of middleweight. And middleweight is a preview of light heavyweight, and light heavyweight is a preview of heavyweight. <laughs> it's like increasingly getting worse and worse with much the same problems in all divisions. Lightweight has largely been able to unfuck itself, but mostly because Khabib Nurmagomedov uh, has retired. So I guess there's that. I've said there's that a lot. (laughs) I think it's just indicative of how MMA tends to work. It's always like, at least there's that. Flyweight is obviously an assassinated division. It's a division that survived an assassination attempt, but it's been irreparably damaged it's uh, a chunk has been taken out of it uh it, it got uh, shot in the leg by an elephant gun <laughs> basically <laughs> so it's limping forward 
uh, like crawling across dirt, trying to bring itself to safety. Not quite getting there. It's uh, it's almost there with Brendan Moreno, but Brendan Moreno is not exactly like the caliber of fighter like someone like Demetrius Johnson was. Uh, Demetrius Johnson is now uh, old and in one, and been there for a while. I mean, uh, the women's division are the women's divisions. Um, Strawweight is really like the only real. MMA division that uh, women's MMA has, but only barely. And I'm not saying that as an indictment on... I'm not trying to shit on female fighters. Uh, I think it's not their fault. I think it's the fault of coaching and MMA in general. It's a side effect of coaching. I've talked about this a lot throughout the year, but just to just emphasize it once again before the, the end of this year and uh, before we get into the next year. Blah, blah, blah. Coaching in MMA is extremely uneven. And whenever I criticize fighters, it's usually a shorthand for me criticizing the camp. Uh I think it's a cultural thing. In Russia, whenever a fighter doesn't display... Whenever a fighter has a hole in their game... Or whenever a fighter displays uh, a questionable trait that leads to the said fighter losing a fight, uh, or like having a hole, a possible flaw, or a habit that will lead to a defeat somewhere down the line, it's always put on the coaches. It's it's the coach's responsibility to cover that hole, to fix that flaw, to work around that habit, or to turn that habit into a strength. And you don't see that in MMA all too often. Most fighters, even at the elite level, have a habit or a flaw or a hole that opens for a possibility of losing to an unfavorable matchup. And I uh, I know that sounds logical. I know, I know that sounds like perfectly fine. But in more well-established sports like boxing, Muay Thai, kickboxing, etc., etc., etc. The list goes on and on. The quality of a champion is... of an all-time great elite competitor. It's generally... like One of the criteria by which you judge an all-time great competitor is how they navigate it. An unfavorable matchup. And I think... I honestly think we've yet to see that in MMA today with uh, any of our champions that we've had except Georges Saint-Pierre and except Fyodor Emelianke incidentally enough also Alexander Volkanovsky I mean certainly you can come up with uh, a few more examples or maybe like a few more Examples based on your understanding of the semantics, it can turn into a lengthy, like very, into a lengthy argument that is just bogged down in semantics. And these arguments happen every day in combat sports discourse. Uh, in combat sports discourse, and it's very like aggravating. It's very tiring. Don't want to get into one of those. What I'm trying to say is, don't fixate on the names that I've named. And don't fixate on the definition of the words that I'm saying, please. What I'm trying to say is that MMA has a ways to go. MMA has a long road ahead of it to develop. And if we do not raise our standards, if we do not hold our competitors to a high level of standard, if we do not put a lot of... uh, If you do not hold the camps accountable to a high degree of responsibility, the sport will not develop. The sport will stall. Obviously, it can continue developing, but it will, the development will be faster if more fans were to evaluate the sport critically, to critically think about what they're watching, about what they're seeing on the screen, and what the commentators are telling them to think, what the organizations, the UFC, 1FC, Ryzen, whatever, tells them to think. Just learn fighting, study fighting. Don't, you don't necessarily have to train yourself or compete yourself. Just educate yourself. 
And the more educated the fan base becomes, the more pressure is there, the more incentive is there for the organizations to uh, continue putting putting out quality products. Because so far, and I've talked about this with Dan Tom, so far what the organizations do is sell a narrative and bank on the lack of education among fans, among five fans, to sell a subpar product for more money than it's actually worth while underpaying their employees. That's the model. And that's what we're trying to combat here. That's what we're trying to fight here at the fight site. We all want our favorite hobby to become better. We want good product as consumers. Even from a purely personal, purely selfish reason, for a purely selfish reason, you would like to want to, like MMA to be better. You should want MMA to be better for a purely selfish reason, outside of all the altruism stuff. Like, at the basest, at the basicest of basic levels, at least you should crave for that. I'm not even asking you to become a better person or whatever. Just asking you, like, as a fan, this is where we're at. This is where we are at. I'm asking you to just care about getting quality entertainment. And one of the ways to get quality entertainment is just vote with your dollar. Do not buy shit pay-per-views. Do not, bo- do not, do not, like, subscribe to ESPN Plus to watch dog shit cards every week. And if more fans are to uh, learn to critically evaluate skill to a decent degree, then the companies in charge of this market would lose power. They would lose bargaining power to just... To, to, they would lose the ability to basically like shovel shit into your mouths. Just to drown you in this sludge week to week while abusing their workers. Because if like many people talk about how, oh, you should support the fighters by buying, buying pay-per-views, buying uh, subscription services. No, they're, they're not seeing a cent. They're not seeing a penny of that money, of any of that money. So your support does not support them necessarily. It supports the company. It's two different things. So back to the topic of coaching. Uh, WMMA, uh, I think it, it, it warrants its own episode. It warrants an entire episode that where I talk about it, where I talk about all the reasons uh, why it's not up to the standard that I hold most MMA to. Uh, part of the reason is uh, the fact that the talent pool is uh, shallow, obviously. Not a lot of women, sadly, go into MMA for various reasons. Uh, a lot of them are societal reasons, the societal norms, the gender norms, etc. The other reason is uh, the fact that um, there's uh, obviously a degree of discrimination uh, like that uh, women have to face at multiple levels entering MMA. And uh, the fact that they receive bad instructions. And like the sheer fact that a lot of uh, women end up dating their coaches for one reason or another, with huge age gaps in certain cases, is just uh, another uh, telltale sign of the fact that uh, WMMA still has a long way to go. It still has a ways to go. Uh, it's a, it's an even lengthier. Uh, bumpier road than like men's MMA in general and I guess this is me uh, once again re-emphasizing my mission statement I just want MMA to be good but in order for something to become good or become better you need to point out all the flaws in it and I guess this is my job now it says um, uh, w- 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 a contributor for the uh, Southpaw uh, for 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 outlet. Uh, it's called Southpaw. It talks about combat sports and um, uh, as well. It's uh, I I do not agree with a lot of what they say or what uh, with a lot of their policy and with a lot of what their chief editor I guess says. Um, but 
uh, I still appreciate them for actually like putting in efforts to understand the sport and like trying to uh, for, for for being like I guess an enclave of for fans of sorts. But anyway, uh, Carrion of Southpaw has said that uh, she appreciates me for being able to be an asshole but constructively, and I guess this is my job description now. I'm an asshole but constructively. I'll, and I'll, I guess this is my new year resolution to just continue doing what I'm doing, to continue being an asshole for your entertainment, <laughs> but constructively. Anyway, I like, I hope I haven't bored you with this uh, really like rambly. I mean, all my episodes are incredibly rambly, but this one is especially rambly because it's the end of the year. It's a New Year's Eve. December 31st, and uh, I'm about to head out and uh, prepare the holiday dinner. Uh, a lot is, is on my mind today, but uh, I've tried to, I've tried as hard as I could to offer you a piece of content before the end of the year. At the very last, at, at the very last second, I've managed to do that somehow. <laughs> so I guess you're welcome. Anyway, I guess it's time to wrap this one up. I uh, guess that's enough of that. Uh, huge, th- um, huge thanks to everyone at the fight site for being good friends. And um, thanks to the fight site community, the, the fight site discord for uh, being such... Uh, be, well, obviously being ob- obviously being such a supportive community full of interesting people. Um, so I guess everyone, thank you for being you. Special thanks to Ed for actually employing me, uh, for giving me an opportunity to finally express myself in a meaningful way and uh, make some money off that. Uh, Special thanks to everyone who offered me feedback and uh, given me advice on how to go about my business, go about doing my job. Thanks to everyone who um, offered honest criticism of uh, whatever it is I'm uh, whatever it is I've done wrong or could have done better I always take that to heart I always take that seriously uh, yeah it's been a hell of a year uh, never in my life have I thought that I would do something like that for a living like never crossed my mind uh, I've always wanted to do something creative for a living, but I've always thought that it's something that I'm going to come to. It's something that's, it's a point that I'm going to arrive to after a lifetime of misery and suffering at, <laughs> after working at a real job for a huge number of years. But here I am doing that for a living instead. So that's a privilege. It's uh, the fact that I got to meet so many people. Uh, so many interesting people that uh, enjoy what I'm doing, enjoy my content. It's kind of overwhelming. It's very overwhelming when you think about it, because like I'm uh, I'm just a random guy. I literally live in a village. I've emphasized this many times because it's just that significant. For my entire life, I've never thought that someone from my region would be able to do accomplish much of anything. Never thought that. I would be able to accomplish much of anything, do anything significant. Because life, um, the reality of uh, living in Siberia, in my region, in uh, Lanode, it's um, it's very prosaic. Prosaic? It's not very interesting, basically, what I'm trying to say. It's not very colorful, it's uh, very drab, it's very boring, miserable. Shit constantly breaks down. New laws keep coming out that uh, impede, like that, um, impede our freedoms, our personal freedoms as citizens. Uh, money keeps uh, keeps falling down. The the, uh, the ruble keeps devaluing, losing value. Uh, the prices keep rising. Cost of living keep keeps rising while uh, uh, people keep making less and less money. Sanctions, politics, the blah 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 blah. The only way out, the only way up, rather, is to leave this place. Honestly, but and I've never thought I'm going to accomplish that outside of like certain avenues that 
didn't seem possible at the time and don't seem still don't seem possible but with uh, the fight sites and with our community growing and the support of our website growing it can actually happen somewhere down the line if we continue like this if i continue working like this so th this, this is something that's uh, i'm very much looking forward to it's i'm not holding out any hope hope is dangerous it's helpful to keep it in mind gets me through most days basically what i'm trying to say is there are several prospects there are well, two primary prospects you're facing when you grow up like like i do you either become a horrible alcoholic and drink yourself to death or you become a horrible alcoholic and work a shit job and then you uh, drink yourself to death after a number of years after working a shit job <laughs> for several years uh, for like 10 years it's not very pleasant so once again I have to uh, restate I have to say this again thank you very much for your support uh, I, I literally couldn't live without you <laughs> or at least I couldn't afford decent-ish living <laughs> without you <laughs> decent-ish standards of living without you I wouldn't be able to afford it I, I mean it's sad but true that's literally how how it is I'm not exaggerating if anything I'm kind of like playing it up uh, but I, I'm not in the habit of complaining about shit we'll pull through uh, this job has genuinely genuinely been life changing for me and uh, I intend not to disappoint. All right, before this gets too sappy, uh, here's to another year of hopefully good fights, <laughs> cool new developments in the sport, new faces, uh, promising prospects, incredible title fights, uh, all the good stuff in life <laughs> it's very easy to burn out and lose focus following this sport uh, a lot of um, demoralizing things happen in this sport uh, but I mean that's how uh, that's one of the reasons why I consider fighting uh, I've said this before many times and it sounds very wanky now that I think about it but fighting is a microcosm of the human condition uh, I will keep saying this until it gets like hammered home, until the point finally hits home with the fan base. Fighting is a microcosm of the human condition. It uh, showcases the best and worst of humanity at the same time. The lowest of the the lowest of the low, uh, basically the lowest lows and the highest highs are present in this sport, and uh, it's kind of like it gives you a heightened experience of what it is uh, of what it is like to really live your life to its fullest but at the same time it's very easy to burn out uh, from all this excitement uh, or from all this depressing stuff that keeps happening but I think the good bits are worth it uh, the good bits are worth enough for us to continue enduring the bad bits and that's, I think that's also true in life. And that's why I think I gravitate towards combat sports so much. That's why I enjoy the sport so much. Um, I think it pays to remember that. All right. That's your final Tengri Dome for the year. Uh, I'm off to celebrate. Uh, hopefully you have... Uh, uh, hopefully uh, it was uh, hopefully the holidays were spent well on your end as well I think yeah I think that's it that's all I have to say really uh, anything else would be uh, excessive I guess and I've, I think I've overstayed I'm sorry overstayed <laughs> a little bit of a uh, Chekhov mispronunciation <laughs> 
<laughs> there, like <laughs> from Star Trek. Uh, I have to get out of here before I embarrass myself uh, even more. I've overstayed my welcome already. I'm gonna head out. Uh, happy holidays, everyone. Uh, keep your hopes up and your chin down. Cheers. <laughs>